May I ask those who are leaving the chamber, both in the public gallery and on the floor, to do so a bit more quietly, please? Thank you very much. The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 5012 in the name of Colin Smith on snaring. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and with those members who wish to speak, please press the request to speak buttons now. I call on Colin Smith to open the debate around seven minutes, please, Mr Smith. Thank you, President Officer. Can I begin by referring members to my entry in the Register of Members' Interest, where it states I'm a member of the League Against Cruel Sports. Can I also thank the many MSPs from across Parliament for supporting my motion and therefore allowing today's timely debate on snaring to take place. I'd also like to thank the, the League, One Kind, Cats Protection, Scottish Badgers and SSPCA for their assistance in providing information I requested to assist with today's debate. As members will be aware, snares are, are thin wire nooses set to trap animals around the net, usually foxes and rabbits. Legal snares aim to tighten as the captured animal struggles, but relax when the animal stops pulling. It is intended to hold the animal alive until the snare operator returns to kill it, usually by shooting or release if the snare has caught the right, the wrong target creature. Although their purpose is to immobilise target animals, the, the reality is often very different. Most snares cause extreme suffering to animals and can often lead to a painful, lingering death. They're also indiscriminate. They may aim to catch a fox or a rabbit, but they're just as capable of catching cats, dogs, badgers, otters, deer, hares and livestock who often suffer terrible injuries or are killed. Today's debate allows us all to ask the question, is there a place for such indiscriminate cruelty in Scotland in 2017? It's six years since this Parliament last debated the use of snares. It was during the passage of the Wildlife and Natural Environment Scotland Act 2011. At that time, Parliament regrettably, in my view, chose not to ban snares, but instead introduced a new regulatory regime. It was also agreed that this regime would be reviewed before the end of 2016 and every five years thereafter. That first review of snaring carried out by Scottish Natural Heritage on behalf of the Scottish Government was published in March. It was a review that has rightly been described by the League Against Cruel Sports as a missed opportunity and by one kind as destined to fail. The review group set themselves three aims, to assess the efficiency of the legislation, to review snare training and assess the effectiveness and compliance with the administrative procedure for obtaining snaring ID, and thirdly, to consider any evidence of outstanding animal welfare implications in relation to snaring and whether these are sufficiently addressed through the provision under Section 11 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act as amended. It is clear that the review failed to meet the first and third of those objectives. If we look firstly at the very brief section in the review on animal welfare, it actually states it is not within the scope of this review to assess whether the degree of suffering is acceptable. Presiding officer, the legislation in agreed in 2011 was supposed to be about improving animal welfare. So surely any meaningful review of that legislation needed to ask the fundamental question in modern Scotland, is this practice under this so-called new regime cruel or not? The lack of any proper focus on animal welfare issues is probably just not surprising given that in carrying out the review there was no meaningful consultation with NGOs who actually have experience of animal welfare issues and extensive fieldwork on the matter. The focus of the review on the number of offences as the measure of efficiency ignored the documented evidence available on animal suffering and completely missed the point that snaring still causes suffering to target animals caught in these barbaric tracks but which don't merit the term an offence. The focus on offences was also ineffective because the review group did not have access to numbers of snaring crimes recorded by legacy local police forces or even Police Scotland as they could not be provided in a suitable format. It is little wonder that the report acknowledged, and I quote, it's important to note that the sample size is too small to perform statistically significant analysis of the incident, SPR prosecution and conviction date. The consequence was a report that failed to look at all the available evidence and proposed only a very small number of recommendations, including tweaking snare designs. Now, I have no objection to any of those recommendations, but they simply do not go far enough. Indeed, as part of the review process, a technical assessment group was set up in parallel with the review group. That technical assessment group made 26 suggestions, yet the overwhelming majority were completely ignored in the final report of the review group, with no explanation or even reference to them in the body of the report itself. 
Not surprisingly, prior to the publication deadline of SNH review, One Kind and League Scotland worked together to commission their own report into snaring in Scotland entitled Cruel and Indiscriminate Why Scotland Must Become Snare Free. This report concluded in a quote, snares inflict unacceptable suffering on thousands of wild and domestic animals in Scotland every year. Continuing to permit the use of these cruel and indiscriminate traps flies in the face of modern concerns about animal welfare, conservation and the wider environment. Unacceptable suffering, cruel and indiscriminate. President officer, it is astonishing that in Scotland today we still allow devices which cause such suffering in such an indiscriminate way to be used in the name of control. I can give members countless examples in the south of Scotland alone which demonstrate the appalling harm that snaring causes to animals. In June last year, a pet cat returned home to her family in Ayrshire with a snare caught around her neck and front leg. The cat suffered atrocious injuries which the vet believed were caused from chewing herself free from the snare. The vet also informed the family that had the cat been caught around the neck alone, she would have most certainly died. There was a recent case of a family, Jack Russell, which became trapped in a snare in Borg near Kirkcubri, which was set close to a path used by walkers. Despite the snare being free running with a stop on it, it did not have an ID tag, rendering it illegal, a common issue. In Cumnock in 2015, a brown hair leveret was born while her mother was trapped in an illegal, untagged snare. In this case, the mother had already died, and despite expert care, the baby hair was also later to die. Late last year in Lead Hills Estate in my South Scotland region, one kind responded to a complaint from a member of the public about a fox being caught in a snare. Unfortunately, the responding unit were unable to find the fox and in returning to the site the next day, found it with horrific injuries piled on top of a stink pit, an issue I know Christine Graham will speak about later in the debate. But let me lead a, read a brief description of what the member of staff who found the fox described. It looks like the steer killed the fox by causing that massive wound. There were gobbets of flesh in the grass and blood and fur. The fox's eye was bulging out so much, which must have been due to being strangled by the snare. Just last week at a farm in Dumfries and Galway, a badly decomposed snare badger was discovered. Despite the police responding quickly to the discovery, no charges are being progressed. Protected species such as badgers, otters, alongside domestic animals are regularly caught in snares. In fact, the Snare Watch website indicate a non-target capture rate that is consistently between 60 and 70%. Despite tightening legislation around snaring, non-target catch continues to be an issue which stands in direct conflict with our conservation objectives here in Scotland. So what's the alternative? Well, we don't have to look too far from the report itself to see the alternatives to snaring. SNH themselves do not employ snaring on any of the land that it owns or manages directly, including their 36 reserves. In 2010, their head of policy stated, we think other methods are effective enough for our purposes and we are concerned about the possibility of bycatch. Other methods, methods such as cage traps, exclusion fences, habitat management and even novel deterrents such as llamas are being used to guard livestock from predators and have all been shown to be effective alternatives to cruel and indiscriminate snares. In concluding, President Officer, I believe the time has come for this Parliament to be bold and courageous and do what is right for animals in Scotland. We see the Conservatives in England singing the praises of fox hunting yet again. When it comes to animal welfare, we all have to ask ourselves in this parliament, whose side are we on? I believe passionately in a ban on snaring. I know many members share that view. More importantly, so does the vast majority of the public in poll after poll. They know you simply cannot regulate cruelty. I therefore ask the Cabinet Secretary today to acknowledge that the review carried out by Scottish Natural Heritage did not go far enough and ask SNH to revisit the report to ensure that it fully meets its objectives and to go further and commit to consulting the public on the outcome of that report, including gaining their views on an outright ban on this outdated, cruel and indiscriminate practice. Thank you. We now move to the open debate. Uh, speeches of no more than four minutes, please. Christine Graham to be followed by Finlay Carson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I make my apologies in advance to members. As you know, Deputy Presiding Officer, I can't say after my own speech as I have almost immediately to chair the meeting of committee conveners. I congratulate Colin Smith on securing this debate, who, like me, is a fully paid up member of the cross-party group on animal welfare. Pertinently, animal welfare was the very issue not considered in the review of the snaring legislation carried out by SNH and highlighted by one kind and the League Against Cruel Sports. I have, 
been and still am wholly opposed to snaring notwithstanding legislation and regulations introduced to police it. I was here and took part in the stage three debate on the Wildlife and Natural Environment Scotland Bill in 2011, and I said the following in support of an amendment to prohibit snaring. Quote, I speak not just with my heart, but with my head, which is no bad combination. I say to the minister that I fully acknowledge that pest control is a necessity of life. I have a long-standing opposition to snaring, and it is not the result of blind prejudice. Indeed, I recently chaired a debate that the cross-party group on one welfare held when we had the gamekeepers and land managers on one side and the animal welfare groups such as One Kind and the SSPCA on the other. The debate was straightforward. It was held in a very civilised and informed manner. The result was 13 each, no white hats, no black hats. The SSPC in particular showed respect to the gamekeepers. It made it plain that much intelligence on animal cruelty and un unauthorised pest control is brought to it already referred to. I am not yet convinced that the stops and the regulations that have been brought in will prevent those instances. Regulation and licensing is better than what we have, but it's not enough. Let us look at reporting and policing. How would a member of the public who came upon a dead or dying animal in a snare know whether the snare was licensed? They would not know. I think that Parliament will accept that people with no scruples will lay illegal snares or even legal snares and not check them or set them properly. In a previous date, I, debate, I asked who would go out in the various valleys in the pouring rain to check snares. Will everybody go out within 24 hours to check a snare? I doubt it. For me, simplicity in law and enforcement are key tests. I therefore ask members to consider whether they accept that cruel, slow deaths will still occur, notwithstanding regulation and reviews. The simplest, cleanest and most enforceable thing to do is to ban snaring. No ifs or buts. End of quote. That was six years ago. And nothing has since persuaded me that enforcement, indeed obtemperance of the law, is satisfactory. I conclude by making reference, as uh, my colleague Colin Smith has, to a motion I have lodged called Stink Pit Stink, which has already, within hours, secured cross-party support for debate. This is closely tied up into the issue of snares, as these open pits, comprised of decomposing carcasses of deer, rabbit, fox, even an occasional domestic cat, are used to lure animals into snares which encircle the pits. That practice and the use of snares would and does turn the stomach of over three quarters of the Scottish population. Let's start with a ban on snares, then we can tackle a ban on stink pits. Thank you. Finlay Carson, followed by James Kelly. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Fox and rabbit control in Scotland is necessary to ensure that damage to crops, livestock, trees, game and other wildlife in their habitats can be reduced to acceptable levels to maintain Scotland's often fragile and unique rural biodiversity. A range of methods are used by gamekeepers, farmers and other custodians of the countryside and snaring is one of the vital tools to achieve these ends. So why is snaring required? Scotland's diverse countryside and landscape means that a range of different methods are required to control the populations and numbers of species such as foxes and rabbits. It's a little out of date, but back in 2010, it was estimated that Britain's 40 million rabbits cost more than £260 million a year in damage to crops, businesses and infrastructure, not to mention the impact on our natural environment, which all of us can see when we walk in the countryside. In my constituency of Galloway and Western Freeze, fox control is a crucial part of countryside management, whether that is to protect a particularly vulnerable species such as lapwings and curlew, or to prevent predation of lambs and free-range and domestic poultry. Other control methods such as shooting can be impractical in areas, particularly in the spring and summer, because of vegetation coinciding with a time when foxes can do the most damage. We need to conduct this debate on the basis of fact in terms of requirements to control the number of species in our countryside. Snaring, often the information is that the vast majority of snaring results in live capture, not injury. I think that one point of clarification that may be useful in this debate is that snares are not used to kill. Snares are a live capture device used by gamekeepers and farmers designed to catch a fox or rabbit without injury until it's dispatched humanely. And we know these injuries are rare. 
Biologists have been using snares for decades as an efficient way to catch foxes and badgers alive in order to fit radio tags to study their ecology. After release, tagged animals show no behavioural behave, abnormal behaviour, surviving normally and breeding normally. When it comes to domestic pets, an operator operating under the guidelines should not set traps near homes. In a study by the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust, it was found that less than 1% of snare-caught foxes were injured as a result of capture. This equates to about 95 foxes per year. And to put that into perspective, the Mammal Society estimated that 100,000 foxes are killed by cars each year. And what, less than 1% of badgers, the badger population, are caught in snares. And most or all of these animals are released uninjured. So what is the law currently? Under the Wildlife and Natural Environment Scotland Act 2011, snaring legislation must be reviewed every five years, and the Scottish Conservatives welcome the additional level this security brings. There is now a significant amount of legislation regarding snare use, including the Nature Conservation Scotland Act 2004, the Animal Health and Welfare Act 2006, the Snare Scotland Order 2010, and the Snares Training Scotland Order 2015. All this means is that snaring is now heavily regulated to ensure that it's conducted in an increasingly humane way, and that is absolutely right. The law states that snares must be checked at least every, every day at intervals of no more than 24 hours, and that they must not be self-locking. Anyone wishing to operate snares in Scotland must be correctly trained to do so. I believe we currently have around 1,500 individuals in Scotland accredited to use snares, this means that anyone putting out snares understands how to properly set them to ensure least injury to the animal and to best avoid unintentional capture of non-target species. In conclusion, I condemn wildlife crime of any kind and snaring which breaks, breaks the law, which of course should be invested fully by the police. Many of the examples that Mr Smith cited were indeed described as illegal snaring. Perhaps we should look at the policing a bit more. My Scottish Conservative colleagues and I support the regulations that I've outlined, but would not welcome an outright ban on snaring. When used appropriately, snaring remains an effective and humane form of fox and rabbit control, particularly in places where alternative methods are not effective, such as areas of high vegetation or rough terrain. That is crucial to avoiding damage to Scotland's crops, livestock, trees, wildlife and habitats. I call James Kelly to be followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you very much, Deputy President Officer. Can I um, welcome the, the work that my colleague Colin Smith has done on this important issue of snaring and also in securing uh, the members' debate, not only in the, the work that Colin's done in the Parliament, but uh, the campaigning that he's done on this issue, important issue in the, the region. Uh, I think the, the importance of the issue is highlighted by the, the kind of opposing contributions that we've had across the chamber but also by the, the, the number of responses that uh, MSPs have had on this issue uh, via email. Um, I was a member of the parliament at the time when the issue was debated uh, back in 2011. And I remember at that time there was a, uh, an extensive email campaign. And I think that's because people feel very strongly about the animal, animal welfare issues at play here. Uh, I remember from the, the previous debate, there were, the, there were quite strong feelings on it. I, I, I recall Christine Graham's speech, um, and it seemed at that time but that the Parliament kind of erred on the, the side of uh, caution. And I think the reason that it, the issue has come back up again is that people find it absolutely barbaric, uh, the, the practice of snaring, and particularly you know, the number of, you know, animals that become entrapped in snares and the, you know, Colin Smith has described it, the, the, the appalling injuries that, that they have and sometimes the appalling way that they die. Uh, I don't think that can be acceptable in a, a humane society. Uh, the Scottish National Heritage Report obviously was charged with uh, addressing some, uh, some of the issues and, and looking again at the issue. Um, it seems... Uh, in reading the report and li listening to members' contributions that it doesn't seem to have addressed the fundamental issue, which is at debate here as, uh, as to whether uh, a ban on snaring, all-out ban on snaring, should be introduced. Uh, I certainly accept that, you know, pest control 
uh, is required. But I also uh, agree with Colin Smith and Christine Graham in that uh, snare in itself is a, 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 a barbaric practice and one that uh, I don't think should be allowed to continue. So I think the, the, the report that's been produced, I think, needs to be revisited. I'd be interested to hear the Minister's view on this and summing up. I think what that, this would allow us to do is to have a, a proper debate and discussion on the issue of snaring. And I think if, if SNH looked again at the report, concentrated on the issues of animal welfare, how to protect animal stocks, and whether uh, an all-out ban on, on snaring uh, could be effective and could be legally enforced. Uh, that allows us not only to continue this debate, but to bring more evidence uh, forward in relation to the debate. Uh, I'm sure if that evidence uh, is, is brought forward robustly, it will reinforce the views of Colin Smith, Christine Graham and, and, and others, and uh, hopefully Parliament can again look at the issue of an all-out ban on snaring. Alison Johnson, followed by Ruth Maguire. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank Colin Smith for securing today's debate and for his well-argued and compelling speech. I'm grateful to all animal welfare organisations who've helped brief us for today, in particular One Kind and the League Against Cruel Sports, for their work over many years leading the campaign for an outright ban on snaring. It is inhumane, it's indiscriminate, it's non-selective. And I think their briefing today makes difficult and disturbing reading. I've always supported calls for a ban, as snaring is a cruel and ineffective method of predator control that indiscriminately captures, maims and kills all manner of animal life, including family pets. And there are many effective alternatives. During the passage of the Wildlife and Natural Environment Act in 2011, Greens argued that the Scottish Government's chosen option of regulation rather than a ban we, we argued against that, and we're firmly of the view that Scotland needs a complete ban on the manufacturer, sale or possession of all snares, and other countries have introduced a ban. Switzerland has a complete ban on all snares. Next snares are banned in 10 member states. A 2005 report of the UK Government's Independent Working Group on snaring highlighted the difficulty in reducing the proportion of non-target animals caught in fox snares even to around 40%, as has been borne out by evidence since. One kind run the snarewatch.org website, where members of the public can report findings of animals trapped in snares and raise concerns about possible misuse or other issues. Of the first 127 reports received, 72 concerned the snaring of family pets. A quarter of animals reported caught were protected species, 25 badgers and four otters, and just 19 of the animals discovered were the supposed target species. In 2016, I called for the Scottish Government to conduct a review of the laws that govern snaring in Scotland, hoping to see a robust evidence-based review, including consideration of the welfare of animals. And the report from Scottish Natural Heritage highlighted in the motion for dis debate this afternoon, recommended that the Scottish Government consider how a code of practice on snaring can be better enforced through legislation. But as has been discussed, this review didn't consider the option of a ban it is a missed opportunity and it has failed to improve animal welfare. And no systematic attempt was made to evaluate the impacts of snaring on the welfare of target or non-target animals. The review reaches the welcome conclusion, however, that snaring of mountain hares causes unnecessary suffering and as such, SNH will no longer issue licences to allow that. The report says that concerns have been raised with SNH over the welfare impacts of snaring hares to the effect that it's difficult to advise on a method of snaring that doesn't cause unnecessary suffering, that they can't be used effectively as a killing trap because animals take too long to die and are not, as if, are not as effective as a restraining means because there's too high a risk of killing or injury. The lack of any apparent means or guidance to avoid this means that SNH will not be minded to issue licences unless the contrary can be evidenced. If snaring causes unnecessary suffering to mountain hares, where is the evidence that other animals experience snaring differently? And I'd be grateful to hear the Cabinet Secretary confirm whether the welfare impacts of snaring foxes and rabbits has also been evaluated. And if so, has their suffering been deemed necessary or will this practice too be banned? If we are serious about animal welfare, 
Rather than maintaining outdated and inhumane traditions, we need to do more, to do better than merely regulating methods as crude and barbaric as snaring. Let's move on to an outright ban. Snares and sink pits are often found in close proximity. Many people in Scotland will be horrified to learn that sink pits, sink pits are legal and exist and have even been seen in our national parks. This isn't an image of Scotland that we can be proud of. I believe that we in the Scottish Parliament have a responsibility to show leadership on this issue, particularly while this most backward looking of UK governments demonstra demonstrates such cruelty, such callous and cowardly disregard for animal welfare at Westminster. And Scottish ministers must rethink their position on this and bring about a snare free Scotland without further delay. Thank you. I call Ruth Maguire to be followed by Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and thank you to Colin Smith for bringing this important topic to the Chamber. I appreciate that there are loud and powerful voices in the countryside lobby, but today I speak on behalf of those whose prime concern is animal welfare and preventing cruelty. And for my constituents who've contacted me on the matter, and for myself, there's simply no way to reconcile animal welfare with snaring. The Snare Free Scotland report by One Kind and the League Against Cruel Sports sets out horrifying examples of the agonising pain and deaths experienced by animals trapped in snares, including non-target species such as Scottish wildcats, mountain hares, badgers, hedgehogs, deer, otters, and even family pets, as we've heard. The inherent and unavoidable cruelty of snaring is just as clear too, if less explicitly so, in the code of practice for snare users, which accompanies the current legislation. In the section on dealing with injured non-target animals accidentally caught in snares, it is advised that wild animals are often capable of surviving significant injuries, although they may suffer prolonged pain in the process. Elsewhere, snare users are given chillingly dispassionate instructions on how to dispatch, i.e. kill, that is, the various species target and non-target. And when discussing the situation with regard to mountain hares, as has been mentioned, the SNH review appears to accept that snares are indefensible in terms of animal welfare, stating that it's difficult to advise on a method of snaring that does not cause unnecessary suffering going on to explain that they cannot be used effectively as a killing trap because the animals take too long to die and are not effective as restraining means because there is too high a risk of killing or injury. Presiding officer, snares are indiscriminate and cruel, resulting in agonising suffering and death for both those animals they intend to trap and those that are trapped unintentionally. It's clear that to accept snares, we must also be prepared to accept the grotesque and indiscriminate suffering and death of animals, target and non-target. No amount of enhanced regulation or subsequent reviews can change this. Some things are just wrong. In preparing for this debate, I concluded that there's simply no way to use snares without causing unacceptable and intolerable, intolerable agony and suffering for animals. No amount of enhanced regulation can change this. Tinkering around the edges is not enough. For this reason, I share the disappointment um, expressed in the motion and uh, of animal welfare organisations. The SNH review did not even consider the option of an outright ban. Rather, the review appears to somewhat sidestep the animal welfare and suffering aspect of snaring, stating that the primary objective of the changes to snaring legislation was to better assure that practices were not causing unnecessary suffering. It is not within the scope of this review to assess whether that degree of suffering is acceptable. Well, presiding officer, it may not have been within the scope of the review to address the question, but for me personally, and for the scores of constituents who've contacted me on this issue, the suffering caused by snares is absolutely unacceptable and it's unnecessary. Presiding officer, as Theresa May plans to ignore the 84% of the public who are against um, the cruel and barbaric practice of fox hunting and bring, back, bring it back, um, it's clear that we here in Scotland also have a power of work to do for standing up for animal welfare here. 
The last of the open speakers, Jamie Green. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, we all know there's been uh, much controversy around the issue of snaring, and I think it's really important that any action we take as a parliament is well considered and takes into the views and concerns of all. I'd like to start with the fundamental question of why there is a need for snaring at all. And I approach this debate with a very open mind. So I read the briefings from the various groups, many have been mentioned today, but I also spoke to farmers and rural experts. Scotland indeed has a diverse rural biodiversity and no one can deny that there is a need for fox and rabbit controls in many parts of Scotland. I think that's something we do agree on. But in particular, we should be aware that crop damage can have a real devastating financial impact on our farmers and indeed our wider agricultural communities, with costs stretching into the hundreds of millions of pounds. And that's a very significant price to pay by not controlling wildlife populations, especially, uh, I've only got four minutes, I'm afraid, especially at a time when farmers' budgets are considerably squeezed. Farmers tell me that crops are being destroyed and livestock is being lost. I'd like to quote from uh, uh, Jonathan Hall, who's head of rural policy for the NFUS, who said that, and I quote, the hill farming view on snaring is that it remains a vital tool in protecting livestock, particularly lambs around lambing time from fox predation. Now I've heard from Johnny Hall on a number of occasions on a number of rural issues, and I value his knowledge and expertise. Of course, we should acknowledge that many do have concerns over the impact that has a snaring has on animals. We've all received many letters about this. And Colin Smith's motion notes that a number of non-target animals such as deer, otters, badgers, hares, and even household pets can fall into snares. And he is right to note this. And these cases sadden me. I think we should work to minimize these instances by ensuring that strict compliance with existing regulation exists and suitable recourse is available to those who break the rules. We should play our part in reducing the impact of non-target animals, but I think an outright ban could be damaging to Scotland's rural economy. Rather than ban, we should be working to improve the current system, and that's why the SNH review made practical recommendations, which have been welcomed by many in the rural community. The majority of animals caught are able to be released, moved, or killed humanely. I would prefer that was 100%, so we need to work towards that. I'd like to point towards existing legislation, such as the uh, Nature Conservation Act, the Animal Health and Welfare Act, and the Snares Order, to name just a few. There are rules in place to ensure that snaring should be done in a humane manner. All snares must be checked at least once every 24 hours, and those who own and operate snares are licensed and trained to do so properly. And that's around 1,500 people in Scotland, I believe. Legislation also, also states that snaring legislation must be reviewed every five years, and I welcome this. This ensures that legislation is up to date, open to scrutiny, and takes into account of all views concerned. But I want to be also clear, I do not support illegal snaring which breaches the rules which have been set in place. And when these incidences occur, they should be investigated and the full weight of the law should be applied. Any violations of this I take very seriously. Now, I'm a big believer that there should be constant improvements to farming practice. I've never met a cruel farmer. So, if snaring is so indiscriminate, then I think the farming community has a duty to develop better alternatives. But until those widespread practical alternatives are available, then we must improve what we have. I welcome this debate, and I do thank Colin Smith for bringing it forward to the Parliament. It is a passionate but very important issue to discuss. My view after listening to the evidence of local farmers in my region lead me to conclude that at the moment, snaring is an important method of capturing animals, but one that requires strict policing and indeed regular scrutiny by this parliament. Thank you. I now call Rosanna Cunningham to respond to this debate. Around seven minutes, please. Uh, thank Secretary. you, Presiding Officer. This has been a short debate, uh, but important nevertheless. And uh, can I say at the outset that I do understand very well why so many members here and why so many members of the public are opposed to snaring. It has always been a difficult and emotive issue. 
Colin Smith referred to harrowing descriptions of animals caught in snares, particularly in illegal and badly set snares, and I'm going to come back to that uh, uh, in the course of my uh, remarks. It is fair to say that nobody really actively likes snaring, but it is something we do believe remains a necessary part of the land manager's toolbox. And in picking up some of the points made in this debate, I do hope I can justify to members why we believe it remains a necessary option that we need to retain for effective predator and pest control. Is snaring needed? Well, it is said sometimes, indeed it's been said here, that snaring and other forms of predator control are unnecessary, um, uh, that foxes only have a relatively low impact on agriculture, and it's true on average fox predation in most cases is well below 5% of lambs, piglets or poultry. But despite the low average losses, it is important to remember that these occur against a backdrop of widespread fox control on site or on neighbouring land. And without some form of fox control, average losses would very likely be considerably higher. Snaring also remains an important tool in dealing with losses to agriculture caused by rabbits. Based on rabbit population estimates made in the mid-2000s, the annual cost to agriculture in Scotland is approximately £59 million. That is every single year. Damage is mainly caused by grazing of grass and cereal crops, as well as to horticultural crops and forestry. And that is a big economic impact. Shooting isn't always practicable or an effective alternative. It's often not possible to get clear or safe lines of sight in which to use a rifle. And the risk is that more animals will be wounded rather than killed outright, an unacceptable animal welfare outcome, which would no doubt then itself become a target uh, for many of those who at bottom probably don't like to see any animal killed. And the truth is, I don't suppose any of us do. Now, a number of members have referred to the snaring review, Colin Smith, Christine Graham, Ruth Maguire. It was carried out within the parameters laid down by the 2011 legislation. It confirmed that the legislative changes made to snaring in 2011 have reduced the number of reported incidents of snaring-related offences and the administration procedure is working satisfactorily. It also recommended several changes that would further refine and codify snaring practices and components. I've already asked SNH to take forward work to revise the code of practice in line with the recommendations. The Scottish Technical Assessment Group, made up of key stakeholders which contributed to the SNH review, will also consider uh, the uh, recommendations in the report. And the snaring review did consider animal welfare. Colin Smith. Reference to the, uh, the, the technical review group, she'll acknowledge that most of their recommendations were completely ignored uh, in the final review group's report. Um, does she not think, given that, and also the fact that the, the SNH report ignored a lot of the evidence that's out there in relation to animal welfare, at the very least, the Cabinet Secretary has asked SNH to review its report and look in more detail at some of the animal welfare issues that have been raised by members today. It is only one page in the report, but it's an issue that surely deserves a lot more detail than that every five years. Oh, I, Rosanna I, Cunningham. I have indicated that uh, the review was already looking at animal welfare. The Technical Assessment Group uh, um, uh, uh, is... Uh, um, uh, one that will go on to consider, uh, as will SNH, a number of aspects uh, of this, and I will ensure uh, uh, that that does happen. Now, Parliament did, as a number of members say, explicitly considered and rejected outright an outright snaring ban in 2011 when we looked at amendments to the Wildlife and Natural Environment Bill. Instead, we changed legislation to improve animal welfare outcomes. And part of that package of changes was a commitment to review how well those intended improvements were working in practice. And that, of course, is the review that we have just carried out. Now, the review found that compliance with the new snaring regulations appears to be high, judged by the numbers of snaring offences reporting, uh, reporting to the uh, PF. Um, Members have referred to specific incidents of bad practice, but we have reduced and will continue to reduce the numbers of these incidents by carefully thought through and implemented technical changes. Many of the worst incidents that we see and hear about involve illegally set snares. Banning snaring will not prevent those who are operating outside the law from continuing to do so. 
With regard to non-target species raised by a, a number of members, it is incumbent on land managers to reduce this risk by the use of good field craft and training. In other words, good snare operators should be setting their snares in locations and in such a way that they are most likely to catch only the target species. And technical improvements will continue to contribute to this. Alison Johnson raised the issue of snaring of hares. There is currently a lack of specific guidance on snaring of hares, and I'm instructing the technical assessment group as a priority to consider how these welfare issues could be addressed before deciding on whether legislation requires to be brought forward. Given these welfare concerns and the fact that snaring operators may also be uh, open to the risk of committing offences in relation to the use of snares for hares, I will ask SNH to set up a meeting with key stakeholders with the aim of putting in place a voluntary moratorium on the use of snares to control brown hares until we have definite advice from the technical assessment group. Um, Christine Graham specifically raised the issue of stink pits and I know that she has a motion uh, in this regard. I do appreciate that it is a sensitive issue. I am also asking the technical assessment group to look at the use of stink pits as part of their consideration of the snaring recommendations. But I do, I do need to say that regardless of where a snare is set, whether it be in a stink pit or somewhere else, it is the responsibility of the snaring operator to take into consideration where they set snares, avoiding locations that are likely to contain non-target species. I'm just closing, uh, 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 presiding officer. I'm not an enthusiastic supporter of snaring. But the position of the government has always been that we do need to control pests and predators to protect livestock and to ensure that fragile hill farms are able to survive. Sometimes snaring is the least bad option. And our approach has been to seek to improve animal welfare standards through training, technical improvements and monitoring and rec record keeping. And in this approach, we've actually led the way in the UK. So our support for snaring as a technique is not unconditional. If a review showed that there was a lack of compliance with the law, we would, have, of course, be prepared to look again at whether snaring should be retained. But that is not the situation in which we currently find ourselves. This meeting is suspended until 2.30 p.m. <laughs>